time. There's no increment and he's already playing with an over two and a half minute deficit. Uh, it's a very, very gutsy decision to go below seven and a half minutes by Wesley. Magnus Carlsen, the pressure is on him. He starts with the King's Pawn opening in this one. We've got the Italian on the board. So not giving Wesley any chance to get the Berlin in. Yeah, Magnus playing what he's comfortable with. This is, of course, the main line. Magnus currently playing. Okay, I was going to say he's playing it without C3. There is that good old C3 and A7, A5, which has become so fashionable in recent years. A6 uh, used to be essentially forced. A5 was unthinkable. And uh, Hikaru's contributed a lot to the development of this line. You sometimes see White's Bishop um, move back to B5. I changed my mind. I, I want to play the Rui Lopez after all. Let's see what Magnus goes for. Rookie one. And a5 comes with the idea to stop the expansion of white on the queen side and also to hint at black's own expansion with either a pawn moving forward to a4 eventually or the b pawn being assisted with the bishop coming to d7 with ideas of b5. Uh, meanwhile, Magnus also has to decide, does he want to stop all the counterplay with his own a pawn going ahead with a4? Yeah, a lot of decisions here. And obviously every Italian position looks like every other Italian position, but there are a lot of subtleties at this level um, to keep in mind. You don't just want to throw out a random developing move. Uh, Bishop B6, of course, is uh, the critical move that you have to evaluate carefully. Now, from White's perspective, do you trade? Do you drop back to C2? He does. Tanya, D4 is a huge threat. And Wesley might choose to beat him to the punch. And I'm a little bit worried about White's prospects should Wesley play D5. But more conservative choice, bishop a7. Definitely a more cagey approach. And Magnus returns the favor. So not rushing with d4. He first develops. It's all about calculating what happens after the trade on d5. If Wesley was to push the d pawn, we're going to see it being played out. Uh, after pawn takes pawn, the e5 pawn is tender. Will Wesley be forced to recapture with the queen? Do the tactics work out in Magnus's favor? Because this means he needs to determine, does he trade or does he keep the structure as is? Now, Magnus likes to keep the tension in these types of positions, but uh, here you need to act very concretely. He takes d5 on the board. Wesley recaptures with the queen. Sometimes you see black playing this kind of martial style um, and sacrificing the pawn on e5, but here Wesley's uh, not going to do that, I think, unless he sees a clear path of gaining compensation. Rook f to e8, again, discouraging white from taking on e5. I wouldn't even consider this move. If I were Magnus, it definitely doesn't work. Uh, typically, the other knight comes out to e4, we could get a trade, and uh, the central situation could kind of rebalance itself if white takes back on e4 with a pawn. This is actually a big decision by Magnus. What kind of structure does he want? And there's our answer. He wants to keep the structure as is, Tanya. Maybe get the bishop out to e3 and neutralize this really annoying bishop that's kind of hiding in wait, waiting for the perfect moment to strike. I like Wesley's position overall. Magnus wants a non-symmetrical pawn structure, which is why he didn't go for the trade with that knight on e4. He reroutes it now to g3. Wesley finally does expand on the queen side. At some point, you have to trade off that bishop on a7. Bishop to e3. Uh, I think Magnus is just waiting, but we're going to see that move on the board, and it's been played now. The bishop on a7 is just such a strong piece that black has. It needs to be out. It's done. But Daniel, I do like how healthy Wesley's position is right now. Yeah, I mean, if all of your pieces are on perfect squares, uh, you can't be that much worse. Wesley's doing okay, but I'm um, keeping an eye on the clock. So far, Magnus has kept that approximately two-minute time advantage. The bishop drops back to c8. In an ideal world, Wesley wants to reroute it to b7. But guess what, Tanya? b7, b5 was an incredibly committal move by Wesley. It was also a very weakening move. Look at that c5 square. If Black's queen ever has to move out of d5, Magnus is going to start doing Magnus things. Uh, things that I thought he was going to do in their first match game kind of go for the queen side square control 94 that's not my arrow that's the computer arrow and that's the magnus arrow it's on the board and suddenly wesley has some problems to solve it's all about that c5 square why now he goes for this trade with the queen coming on to c5 causing some problem forces wesley to make Ooh. sure that doesn't happen but magnus is chasing wesley's queen down the board and if the queen keeps an eye on c5, Magnus will, will establish a rook on d5, and that might be even worse. So rook d5 here, that is vintage Magnus. And just look at the pressure he's exerting all of a sudden from nowhere. Man, if Wesley could take this b5 move back. 
And it looks like the kind of move where black is the one playing for initiative, and it might be you've said b5, you say b4 before it's too Ooh. late, and he does it. b4, but I think it had four. to be played. Oh, no. It's on the board. What does Wesley this have in mind? He needs to defend lost. that knight on c6. He's collapsing. I mean, his whole queen side is collapsing. The knight has no support. His pawns are falling. Bishop b7 trying to stay afloat. He's going to lose some pawns here. Bishop takes c6, Tanya, and just rook takes a5, and white is technically winning. It looks like a healthy pawn. I'm trying to find a way to get to that central e pawn, but not easy at all. Magnus pauses. He's trying to see if there's something better. The e5 pawn will be hanging. The a5 pawn will be hanging. Or will Magnus just keep the pressure as is? Not go immediately to release the tension. We've seen him do that time and time again when he believes that the power of the pieces is more important than getting greedy in the position. The more he slows down, I wonder if he's looking for an alternative to picking up the pawn immediately. Well, he wants a knockout, and I don't blame him. It looks like a knockout might exist. Maybe he's looking at rook c5. At the same time, you don't want to overcook it. Just, you know, take the material advantage. Keep a time advantage. This is even more important, uh, given that he's playing without a mouse. And just the professionalism in converting an advantage, taking some time, making sure that there's no forced win, and then saying, okay, no forced win. I checked uh, all of the tactical moves. Let's cash in my chips. Magnus is nearly perfect at converting these types of positions. Uh, we may still see a queen land on c5, Tanya, because Wesley has to burn another tempo uh, defending this pawn. At this point, he might as well just give it away. How easy did Magnus make it look so far? He's completely outclassed Wesley in this one. Unbelievable how quickly this all happened. Wesley was doing fine. He was bringing his pieces into the center, but b7, b5, right? When you play a move like that against Magnus, you have to make sure uh, that you don't that it doesn't come back to bite you, and it most certainly has. Game is not over. Magnus still it's... needs to convert this extra pawn. Well, he could just go into the kind of positions that he loves the most, trade off the queens oh, off the yeah. board, forcing Wesley for that trade because the bishop on c6 is hanging as well. Queen takes c5, uh, rook takes, but wow. Now Magnus has got these passes on that a file, the b pawn oh, assisting it. It's over. Oh, he missed it, rook a6, won a piece unbelievable what was that he's still completely winning obviously but let me just rewind this for a second what on earth was that rook a6 rook e6 rook c1 and that would have been the end of the armageddon the bishop simply cannot be protected both players just forgetting that the bishop is spin instead magnus uh goes at it from the other side but now this gives wesley a little bit of hope he plays rook e6 now Magnus back on track with b4. He's going to push this bishop out of c6. Tanya White is winning, but you don't want to miss opportunities like that because, um, you know, you don't want to keep this game going longer than it has to. Knight h4, by the way, here is an absolutely brutal maneuver. That might just seal the deal. I love it. I, I was going to suggest rook to c1 to get to the c7 pawn, and then you realize that there are some things to be careful about, like the hanging central e pawn. Magnus goes for the other idea that you pointed out, knight h4, knight f I just love his position right now. I mean, this is just incredible. He's up a pawn. Look at that knight on f5, the rook and the queen lined up. Yes, there's work to be done, but it should oh. be easy for Magnus. He's sacrificing the a pawn to get to that c pawn. And this is what, you know, I want to make make clear about not over-sensationalizing these mutual blind spots. Yeah, Magnus could have won a piece, but guess what? He's converting this in the next best possible way. All of his other moves have been perfect. A4, such a heads-up move, realizing that the bishop is completely paralyzed. It's essentially pinned because you cannot afford to lose the c7 pawn. Just a few more accurate moves here required uh, for Mr. Carlson. And notice how he's kept a two-minute time advantage this entire game as well. He's just outplayed Wesley completely. And it's not that you lose the c7 pawn. You're going to lose your king because the rook and the knight combined <laughs> to put pressure on the g7 pawn, which is why that knight on f5 was such a key piece. Now Magnus frees up his other rook by defending the central pawn. Once the rook comes to c1, how on earth are you oh, going to defend no. it? This is Wesley. He's just giving up. Uh, there's desperation on the camera. He shakes his head. He knows he's about to be out of the Crunch Lab Masters. Man, why don't I get positions like this against Wesley? <laughs> rook e to c1. Just... Take a moment and uh, let your eyes adjust to that position. Of course, Magnus can also play b6, but um, he doesn't even have to rush with that move. He's taking time right now. He's savoring the moment. He knows the game is in the bag. Um, he is just deciding uh, how to best tighten the screws, how to best twist the knife here. Obviously, it's technically not over. Magnus needs to avoid mouse slips. He has to make sure that he finally gets this pawn up to a6 one way or the other. 
Okay, brings the rook back to c1. Time for the final stage, Tanya. He wants to play rook d1 and start swapping some of the heavy pieces to make it easier for these pawns to break uh, to break the Maginot line, to break the last line of resistance here. And I think he's going to be very successful in doing that. Uh, he's also up on the clock. Wesley just played such cagey, cautious chess from the start, just wanting to keep everything in control. And it just did not work. Backfired completely after that move B5, which to me felt like Wesley was getting active, but uh, did not work at all. And Magnus now, he's again paused Rook D1 on the board. You trade that off. The C5 pawn, how are you defending that? I don't see a square for the queen to actually go somewhere nope. and keep itself connected. He might be losing a second pawn in this position. Or even a rook. He's going to lose his soul here. And the last try by Wesley. This is a, this is a great try. Hoping for rook takes c8. Magnus says, um, I was not born yesterday. I'm going to round up that pawn. And I think we are watching Wesley So's last moments. This is resignable. He's three pawns down. Nothing left of his counterplay. This was a wire-to-wire -wire victory by Magnus. The one bold move that Wesley made this entire game, b7, b5. Right, the one move that violated positional principles. Magnus makes him pay for that move for the rest of the game. He never failed to remind him, you played b5, that's what started everything on the queen side. Now there's no queen side left. Wesley's leaning back. He knows that this is all over. He's trying to look for counterplay by doubling up on the second rank, rook d2. But that knight on f5 can at any point come and defend the position. Magnus doesn't even allow that. You can't trade. You trade. That would allow the other rook to penetrate on the eighth rank. Rook c8 coming in, b8 coming in. I think there's a resignation coming in. There is a threat. That there is a mate threat, actually. Um, but Magnus, I think, will drop his knight back to e3. He can move his pawn up to g4. Just the last thing to avoid, b8 equals queen, actually allows perpetual check by black. So you can see the goat there taking his time, choosing among the many, many winning options as long as he addresses the threat of rook takes g2. Knight h4, knight e3, Ooh, g4. Nice. Just defend the pawn one way or the other, and then nothing can stop the queen side. But Magnus, I think he's trying to find the fastest way to victory. He chooses to keep the knight centralized. And Wesley...